been a long time since I've reached at the edge. It's been like six weeks. And it just shows that, like, the church will function without me. But I'm going to get over it. I'm glad to be here. My name is Tony Woodall. Um, if you're new in the last six weeks, I'm one of the teaching pastors here, one of the elders of the edge. And we are in a series called... Does anybody know what the series is called? The Road to Bethlehem. Thank you. <laughs> I can move this thing. Okay. In the Bible, going from Genesis all the way to the Gospels, there's this road to Bethlehem. There are these unique moments, these unique points, these important points in Scripture where the promise that is given in that point speaks to the birth of Jesus. Amen? And we've been in this series for about three weeks. We'll only be in it till Christmas, which I hear the Christmas service is going to be off the hook. We started out in Genesis. We talked about how in the creation... There's a promise of purpose. We know that in the book of Genesis, there's a promise of purpose that will be fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. We went from there into Adam and Eve, and we talked about intimacy, and how through that story, there's a promise of intimacy between us and God, and God and man. And then last week, Mike Alvarez, ladies and gentlemen, you paid me to do it, and I wish I could have got you more. Mike Alvarez preached on Abraham, the promise of belonging, right? Abraham was called by God, and he said, look, I'll give you a place that's all your own. And so in the story of Abraham, we see the promise of belonging. And today, we're going to look at Moses. Yes, the promise of a hero. The promise of a hero. In the story of Moses, we see that Jesus will fulfill the promise of a hero. Does that sound fun? I have props today. I have a Batman mask. I have an Iron Man thing. This thing actually makes noise. There you go. And I have a Superman comic book down here. So I'm glad I have a rolling podium. So with that, let's pray. Let's get into it. We have a lot to get at. A lot of things that God has been speaking to me about um, this message and for you. Hopefully we'll get to most of it. Um, but let's just pray. Let's ask for God to just bless this time and then we'll jump in. Oh, Lord, we love to worship you. We love to gather together. Lord, we love to just be in your presence and be with, with your children and be among the people that you've called your own. Lord, we just love to be here. We love to get in your word and to see what you have to say. Lord, we are moving toward this beautiful season where your son is born into the world, Lord, and we want to be ready, um, anticipating with joy what that's all about, Lord. We're looking to glorify your name through your story. And Lord, we bring you glory by enjoying your story. Lord, thank you for the faithful men and women who have gone before us. Lord, thank you for Moses, who we'll get to meet one day. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you are God and sovereign over all and that you are weaving a story of greatness into, into us, into this church. And Lord, for your glory, it's all, it's all for you. We just pray for a, for a tangible presence to be here, Lord, that you can just captivate us, not by the words of men, but by the words of your spirit. So we do, we invite you and we just, we, just, we just honor your name, Lord. Be satisfied, be glorified, be lifted up, Jesus, in this place. Let your Holy Spirit come and let us be one and, and be in tune with what you have to say this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a superhero crazy culture. Can I get a witness? The top. 15 movies of all time. Guess how many of them are superhero movies? Not all. You guys are crazy. No. Because there's like that Titanic did well. That was the first movie we ever watched together, my wife and I was Titanic. Anyway, um, five. Five of the top. I mean, all time. We're talking like Gone with the Wind. We're talking Avatar. Five of those movies were superhero movies. I'm talking like down the middle superhero movies. I'm talking to like The Avengers, number three. The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight Rises, Iron Man 3, and Spider-Man. All those movies are in the top five of the 15 most grossing movies of all time. We have a hero-obsessed culture. And Steve and I were talking about this. when they Just, just when you think like X-Men can't do anything else or Spider-Man can't do anything else or you know, like, all of a sudden they bring Ben Affleck. Because, you know, obviously the chicks aren't into Batman, I guess. I don't know. 
But I mean, like, they are really striving in Hollywood to make it go. You know, so they start these things called origin movies, right? Because why not, right? Let's go back to the beginning before the comics happened to talk about what it really was like, right? So origin movies are a way for us to make, for them to make more money and for us to get more entrenched in these characters, right? And I saw a trailer that I'm going to show you one minute of that blew me away because for the first time that I know of, we have an origin before the origin movie coming out. So check out the first minute of, what's the name of it? X-Men Days of Future Past. Cha-ching. Watch this. I'm not even kidding. That's all I can show you because the kids will get scared, the kids that are in here. But did you get that, though? They're all out of, they can't do any more origin stories, right? So they got to go back to the origin before the origin. That's how crazy we are. And I will go to that movie. You will go with me. Thank you. Obviously, we are superhero infatuated. Why do you think that is? It's because we know we need saving. Truth? So we're going to talk about Moses because let me tell you something. Spider-Man and Superman and Wolverine, none of those guys ain't got nothing on Moses. But here's what I want to do. I want to look at Moses as the ultimate superhero. I want to contrast him with Superman. I got a Superman comic here. This is all my son's stuff, by the way. This is None of this is mine. It is. I'm serious. I'm going to contrast him with Batman, and I'm going to contrast him with Iron Man. How about that? You want to do that? Sounds like fun? Let's get into it. Let's start out with um, Moses has an origin story like Superman. Are you ready? Here we go. We're going to go to Exodus uh, chapter 1, read verses 8 through 16, and then we're going to skip to Exodus chapter 2 and read a little bit from there. Get your hearts ready for the word. Here we go. Exodus, the scene is the Israelites are in Egypt. They are slaves. They've been there for 400 years. This is what happens. It says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from us. Therefore, let us set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens, and they built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed the more the Israelites multiplied, like the Edge Church. And the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. They made their lives bitter with hard work and service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said, and this is where it gets bad, to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other, Pua, I think. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. Exodus 2, verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman, and the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, I don't know what that means, she hid him three months. But when she could not hide him any longer, 
She took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bitumen and pitch, basically made a little boat. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds of the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would happen to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came and bathed in the river while her younger women walked beside the river. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant women to get it. And when she opened it, she saw it was a child. And behold, the baby was crying. And she took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. The birth of Moses is very similar to Superman. Both babies are born into a hostile environment. Baby Moses was born into a time where the males of his people were threatened by Pharaoh and Superman was born on the planet Krypton in a time when the planet was being destroyed. Right? Am I got that right? And both of them had parents who with great faith set their children into a vessel, Superman, it was titanium or some kind of other space-age metals, and Moses, it was a little basket to float down a river. And in great hope and in great faith, they took their babies, they put them into these little pods to save their lives, and they sent them out into the unknown. And so we see with Moses the hero and Superman the hero, we see that the story starts with the parents. Every hero story starts with the parents. We as parents, and if you're a parent, you need to learn something from this story. We don't have children to keep them. We have children to send them. We can keep them for a moment. We can keep them for a time, probably longer than three months, okay? But we must, at some point or another, we must launch these kids out into a world. Because our children have a destiny, amen? Our children have a purpose. And you know what? Let me tell you that the strategy for our kids' ministry here at the Edge is that we are going to create superheroes, world changers, and we're going to ship them out into the world. Amen? Can we do that? Can we agree to that? Because if we're going to have heroes coming out of this church, it's going to start with the parents. We will launch them with great faith into the unknown, and of course... We won't do that when they're three months old, and we won't do that from an outer planet, but we will do it. Parents, can I get a witness? Moses begins, his story begins with his parents. His parents would not give in to the culture. His parents would not give in to fear. They had hope. They had faith. They imputed that into Moses, and they sent him out. And that's what the stuff of a hero is in the beginning. Of course, this is like God the Father. We know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave. He sent. He sent his son into the world. Jesus, the ultimate superhero, was launched from his father's love into earth. And he was housed in a vessel, a vessel of flesh, very vulnerable. And he was sent to a people that needed saving, sinful man. And God the Father didn't hold his son, but he sent his son. And he put into his son a great faith and a great hope. And Jesus comes, come Christmas, to set us free. Amen? So we see in the beginning, Moses is like Superman, is like Jesus, because the origin story is the same. The parents had great faith, great hope, and they sent their children to save. That was the beginning. And that's how Moses... It's like Superman. Come on now. Superman. Who's, who's Superman is their favorite? No? No one? Okay. All right. How about Batman? You like Batman? Yeah, man. The Ben Affleck Batman or the... No? Taylor's, Taylor's got a thumb down? Okay. So how was... How was so we got that, right? Superman origin story. Um, put in a vessel, saved for his people. Parents faithful. How about... How was Moses like Batman? Well, Batman has this great anti-hero story, right? He has this great love-hate relationship with Gotham. You know what I'm saying? And Moses has that kind of relationship with the Israelites in Egypt. Let's read in Exodus 2, verses uh, 11 through 14. If you've got your Bibles, Exodus 2, verses 11 through 14. 
Moses has a Batman-like anti-hero story like Batman. This is very cool. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people. He grew up in the Pharaoh's court. Remember, the Pharaoh's daughter found him, took him in, raised him like an Egyptian. But Moses had that royal blood of the Hebrew people. So one day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people, the Israelites, looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. And when Moses went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and Moses said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And the man answered, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Uh-oh. Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. Heroes have a tough go. Because they're the first to rise up. Heroes are the first to look around, not like a situation, and rise up to fix it. They are first to rise up and try to set captives free. They are the first to look at the oppressed and say, no, not my people, not this way, I'm going to do something about it. They go first. And this Moses, he was looking at his people He was seeing their sufferings and he rose up to do something about it. But when he did, he realized something really quickly. He realized that he was alone. The people were not with him at first. In fact, the people were afraid of him. He rose up in their defense and the people feared Moses. Why? Well, when you have a people group or anybody in their own life who's been oppressed over years... They tend to live in fear. Amen? They tend to learn that man is something to be afraid of. And when you have people like that that you're trying to help as a hero, sometimes, and Moses found this out, that you'll find out that when you rise up in courage, you actually convict their cowardice. Amen? And so a people who are oppressed, a people who need saving, will not at first recognize great herodom. And the people who need the helping hand will tend to bite the hand that reaches for them. Because there's slavery in the actual physical world. There is slavery. But there's also the slave mentality. And the Israelites of Moses' day were fully given to a slave mentality, and I'll tell you why. If you read Exodus 1, and you read the beginning of the story, starting with um, Joseph, and they were there for a while, you'll read that there were a people, the people of God, that were very comfortable in Egypt. For 400 years, they were in Egypt, and it wasn't until the very end of that time that things started going south for them, right? We just read that they were people who were increasing greatly. They were like the edge church. They were just breeding themselves out of house and home, right? They were growing. Um, They were prospering. If you read the beginning of Exodus, you will read about a people of God who became very comfortable in the world. Now, We know from Mike's story last week that the people of God, the Israelites, had a promised land. They had a land that was not Egypt. They had their own land. They had their own promises. But when they settled into Egypt, they got really comfortable and they got fruitful. But see, the Israelites were not there to make a home. The Israelites were supposed to be there for a brief time to escape a famine. But when they found that the place suited them, they stayed. And that's the beginning of the slave mentality. Because it was only when things really started getting bad that they reached up, they called up to God, and God heard their cry. But before that, they didn't want God. They didn't need God. And so we see a slave mentality was beginning in the people, and it led to slavery. And here's the lesson for us. There was a lot of heat in this part of the sermon when I was preparing it. And here's a lesson that I believe is for all American Christians, all first world Christians. I want you to hear this word, okay? Here's the lesson for us. 
We become slaves. We become slaves to the world when we find comfort in it. Slavery, right? Slavery to the world begins when we are content in the world. The slavery mentality precedes actual slavery in the world. Our culture is obsessed with heroes. We're obsessed with heroes. Why? We're not enslaved. Or are we? I think that the American church, the first world church, is plagued with some of the same slavery of those early Israel Egyptians. See, we are prone to love the world. Is that fair? I'm just speaking for me. If you want to jump into this water, you can jump in. Something God's been speaking to me. I'm prone to love the world. And I, as an American Christian, I want to gravitate to personal peace and affluency. I want to gravitate to those things that enslave my mind to the world, and I want to ignore the greater call of God sometimes. You see, the Israelites loved Egypt before they were enslaved by Egypt. Does that make sense? And it's true that Moses was sent to free an enslaved people. But when we see him rise up and do that, they retaliate because what he had to do as well, what Moses had to do as well, is he had to, he had to free people who had a slave mentality. He had to free a people of God, a people of the promises, a people who had their own land. He had to free them from a mediocrity. He had to free them from a contentment. He had to free them from a love of the world before he could free them to the world that God has for them. This happened to Jesus as well. Jesus is certainly a hero. Jesus was certainly sent to a people who were enslaved. They were occupied by Rome. And in John chapter 11, verses 47 through 48, we see the slave mentality again, and I'll read. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man, Jesus, performs many signs. And if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Now watch this. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. You have the people of God occupied by Rome acting like they got a place. Come on. And so you got Jesus going around talking about freedom, talking about peace, talking about life, talking about how he wants to free people from the slave mentality first and then free them in the physical, natural. And he was freeing them of diseases and illnesses and he was giving them real teachings and true teachings. And he was saying, come on, don't you know? You're the children of God. You are settling for the world and I'm trying to rise up to help you, but I'm the anti-hero. You're being like Gotham to me, says Jesus. I want to free you from yourself first. I want to free you from the slave mentality. You are serving an earthly king, and you're going to kill me, says Jesus. You're going to kill me to continue to do it. And I'm trying to free you to serve God. You see, that slave mentality is what leads to slavery and the natural. And what we see in the story of Moses is he's the anti-hero because he comes to a people to free them from the shackles, but they still got this enslaved as well. And that's how Moses is like Batman. The anti-hero. You love him, you hate him, you need him, you don't want him. You only want him for a time and then you kick him out the other time. Give me the world and give me Jesus at the same time, right? Do we want to be slaves? If we are slaves in this world, it's because we fell in love with it first. Do we want to be free? Let's not be Gothamites to Batman. Let's not be Israelites to Moses. Let's not be occupied people like they were to Jesus. Let's be the new Jerusalem. Hmm. Let's not settle for this world. Let's look to the world that God has for us, the place that God has for us, the kingdom that he wants us to build. Let's not bow the knee of comfort and personal peace and affluency for the sake of our own comfort, but let's look to what Jesus wants us to do in this world today. Amen? Slave mentality. I want to talk about Iron Man now. Can we talk about Iron Man? The way this thing works is you're supposed to like take it off and then, is Josh here? No, he's not. And then you're supposed to put it on your chest somehow and then like it's supposed to like 
when, you, when you're in trouble or something, you're supposed to push it. I, I don't want to do that right now, but it's really cool. I want to do that again because there's different noises. That's cool. <laughs> Who likes Iron Man? He's my favorite, man. He's got that cool goatee. I, can never, I don't have the jaw for it, you know, but I would. Well, Moses is like Iron Man too, actually, because Moses has a, uh, a refining season experience that really shaped him. Right? He has a refining season experience. He has that desert time, that 40 years in the desert that um, really made him who he is. And, you know we, know, we know Tony Stark, right? You guys know the character Tony Stark? Played amazingly by Robert Downey Jr. He should get a, is it Emmys or Grammys? What do you get for those? Oscars. He should get, <laughs> if he was singing, I'd give him a Grammy. I don't care. He's an awesome, isn't he? <laughs> no, i give him an Oscar, man. I know it's a superhero movie, but they're making lots of money, and that guy's brilliant. So anyway. Well, we know Tony Stark, right? Tony Stark is a guy who was born on third base and thought he hit a triple. Right? He was born into a rich family. He was born to a dad who built this great company, and it was all given to him, and he was cocky, huh? Really? Tony Stark? But then he has that moment in the desert, right, where he gets blown apart, and he gets, you know, enslaved by people that make him put his mind to work for them. And and then in that moment, in that refining season, in that desert where he's being occupied, in that time, he finds a new motive, he finds a new inner strength, he finds a new heart, right? He finds a new purpose, he finds a new power. That happened in the desert. Could you imagine Tony Stark without the desert? That'd be bad. It'd be Robert Downey Jr. in real life. In the same way, Moses, he has, a, he has a refining story. He has a refinement. He's raised in the courts of Pharaoh. He's probably entitled a little bit. They worshiped the people in the courts back then. You've got to think it went to his head a little bit, right? He had a pretty high opinion of himself. I mean, who would look this way and that and then kill somebody? You'd think that maybe you planned that a little bit better. You know what I'm saying? Like, he didn't look very good. You know what I mean? So, like, if you're going to murder, like, one of the most powerful people on the planet, you might want to think a little bit more about it. You know what I'm saying? But if you have a high opinion of yourself and you think you're smarter than everybody else, you might just do that in anger. And so Moses has to get up and he has to flee to the desert. And we know the story, right? We know that he has to go run for his life to the desert of Midian. And Exodus says that Moses was in the desert for 40 years. Say 40 years. Man, I'm 38 and I feel like I lived 100 million years already. I'll tell you, 40 years. Can you imagine 40 years? That was a refining season and Moses, like Tony Stark, he had to get his motives ironed out. And what was harder for Moses, do you think? It was, the, was it the time or was it the fact that he went from, a Pharaoh, went from the, 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 the apple of Pharaoh's eye and went from the Pharaoh's court to herding sheep? Was it the fact that he went from the most powerful kingdom in the world and he went to like living in the pasture? Was it the time or was it the work? Was it the labor? Or was it all the time that he had to think about who he was and who he wasn't? Where he had to patiently endure that grinded out life? And I think for so, mu- so, so many of us, especially folks with younger kids, you know, we get up and it's a grind, man. You know, and we wonder like, what is God doing what is he doing? Why has that kid got his diaper off again? What's happening? I'm not talking about Josh, okay? I'm talking about your kids. Josh is 12 years old, for God's sake, you know? But what Moses didn't realize, and I think sometimes we don't realize this when we're being refined, is that God is working on our character. Amen? He's working on the motives, the underthoughts that make us think. The underthoughts that make us act. And so for 40 years, Moses was being refined. And it was after that time, it was after that time that God visited him. And we'll read that right here in Exodus 4, verses 1 through 5. We'll read about when God visits Moses after his refining period. And we'll see that God in the desert made a hero. Here we go. Exodus 4, verses 1 through 5. Then Moses answered, now God has called him, God, the burning bush, the the magic, all the cool stuff that God did, and God's speaking to him, God's revealing his name to him, and then God says, I want you to go, and I want you to go and free the Israelites. And then Moses says, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, right, that whole anti-hero thing, right? 
They will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And Moses said, a staff. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And so he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. (laughs) I would too. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch that by the tail. And so he put his hand out and he caught the snake by the tail. And it became his staff again. He put it in his hand. And the Lord says, I did that that they may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, Abraham, the, God of, the, the, the man of promise, Abraham, and Isaac and Jacob, I did that so that they will believe that I am with you. And in this little four or five verses, we see the making of a hero. And I'll show you real quick. We start out, Moses has a staff in his hand. It's his. And that staff represents his life. Represents his power. Represents his talent. His authority. It's his. Right? And before the refining, we see Moses rising up in his own strength and trying to free a people. And they weren't having it and Pharaoh wasn't having it. But now, Moses still has strength. He still has power. He still has his own life. And God says to lay it down. And he does. In a show of humility. That refining desert time taught him something about God, taught him something about himself, and he throws it down. We all have a staff in this world. We all have an authority. We all have talent. We all have treasure. We all have a staff. We have a place in this world. We have, we have our own life. And the first thing to do if we want to be a hero, and I want to be a hero, you want to be a hero, is we lay the staff down at the Lord's feet. We lay down our life first. So God tells him to lay it down, and Moses does. He lays down his life, so to speak. He lays down his purposes. He lays down his power. He lays down his own protection. His staff was also his protection. He is willing to submit himself to God after 40 years. Then it says the staff becomes a snake. This is so cool. The staff becomes a snake. You know, a snake is an unruly beast, right? God turned Satan into a, yeah, A snake is hostile to God. A snake is slippery. A snake has ill motives. It can coil up and strike. This represents the heart that's not yielded to God. It's an unruly thing to have power and to not be yielded to God. And this scares Moses, right? And he runs. And I believe what God was showing him here, this is just a prophetic picture. What I believe God was showing him here is, that's your life, that's your heart if you're not yielded to me. That's who you are. And do you know after 40 years of refinement, you know it? Don't you just know when you're in the desert who you are? Those dry places have a way of showing you your motives. They have a way of showing you your intentions. They have a way of showing you who you are apart from God. And I believe that God was showing Moses that when you lay down your life, I'm going to show you what it's like without me, and then I'm going to show you how to conquer that in me. So he he runs away from the snake, and let me tell you something. If you've ever seen your heart, I've seen my heart without God. I run from that too. Amen. People run from me as well. That's how I have a clue. And then God says something really cool. He says, pick it up by the tail. Anybody ever handled snakes before? Any Australians in here? Don't pick up a snake by the tail. What will happen if you pick a snake up by the tail? Come on, this is logic. What will happen if you pick it up by the tail? It will turn around and bite you. Hopefully in the hand. Oh. But see, Moses trusts God. Once you lay down your life, you have this unbelievable ability to do things that seem to be odd. You have an ability to do things that don't make sense. You have an ability to do things that your eyes... Don't agree with. You hear the voice of God. Come on. You have eyes of faith. You have ears that are tuned into the Father because you trust Him, because you laid down your life. You've seen what your life is without Him. You don't want that. And so God says, pick it up by the tail, and He does because He trusts Him, because of refinement. 
He's looking with the eyes of faith now, Moses is, and he's being led by the voice of God, and he's willing to lose his life even for God. But the cool thing is, is when he reaches down to pick up that snake by the tail, it becomes his staff again. And here we have the hero. Because the making of a hero is a formula. It's a yielded heart plus God's power. Notice how God had Moses grab it by the tail and God gave Moses back his power, right? God did not take away his power. God gave it back to him. And God was teaching him. He said, Moses, I know who you are. You know who you are. You've been refined. You know that you'll be a murderer apart from me. You know that you'll be fearful apart from me. You know that you can't do anything without me. You've learned that lesson. You've laid down your life. You know how unruly it is. Now I want you to pick it up because you learned something. What he's saying is is that your ill motives will not conquer you. You will conquer them. You have a choice now, Moses. You have authority over your own life. You have been empowered by me. You've humbled down before me. And now I can give you back your life. And I can give you my power as well. Amen? God is saying, I have not given you a spirit of fear, a spirit of lust or greed, A spirit of control, but I've given you a spirit of power and love and self-control, and you have the self-control. When we lay down our lives and we say, Lord, not my way, but your way. Lord, make something beautiful out of my life. When we lay it down and God says, pick it up again, we are empowered by God, and he takes our power and his power, and he makes a superhero. That's what happens. Supernatural strength combined with a yielded heart, can change the world. Amen? That's the story of the hero and the making of Moses. And God's calling us today to rise up. God's calling us today to do things that may not seem to make sense. God is calling us to lay down our lives. God is calling us to put that stick down, watch it go haywire and pick it up again because we have in him, we have authority to do so. Because the superhero is not void of a will. He's not void of his own strength or she. They choose to yield their strength to God, to be used by God for great things. And so in the refinement, in that desert time, Moses slash Tony Stark gets a new heart, a new purpose for being and a new way of being, a higher call. And God gives him that staff, which represents the best of man and the best of God, because that's how God wants to do it. And he says, now go out and make history. And we know that he did. Amen? And so we see in this story, we see in Moses, we see the promise of a superhero. We see glimpses into Jesus, right? We see a Superman-like birth, um, a baby born in turmoil, but sent out by the parents in faith. And it always starts with the parents if the making of a hero is going to happen sent out in faith, and they eventually become great. And we see the anti-hero at work here, right? We see a people who at first, because of the slave mentality, didn't understand what Moses was trying to do for them. And that happened to Jesus as well. And it will happen to you and me. If we're going to rise up, and if we're going to serve, and if we're going to help and free the oppressed, we have to understand that there is a Batman-like thing that will happen But it's okay because right is right. Amen? And then we see this Iron Man refining. We see this 40 years of of just motives and and, and intentions being ironed out by God and being framed. And you know, so many of us, so many, we're always in a desert season to some degree, but so many of us, just because of our age and because of where we are in life, so many of us are being ironed out right now and it's good. It's good. Man, let God do that. He's got great things for you. For those who endure, let him have his way. Lay down your life. He'll tell you to pick it up. And you'll have the power and the strength to do it. And so we see this Iron Man-like power that rises up with the right motives. And of course, Jesus is all these things, right? He's really an alien from heaven sent down to earth, sent down in flesh, sent down in a vulnerable frame. I don't know if a manger floats. I don't know if it does, but it was kind of like a, little, like, like a little basket you can put down the river. But he was put in a manger, and he was sent for sinful man. He was sent to save us from ourselves. 
both bodily and mentally. Definitely the anti-hero, right? This, this Jesus. <laughs> Definitely hated. The Bible says that he was hated and despised by his own people. His own people knew him not, but he went forward anyway because he listened to the voice of the Father. And he was definitely refined by the world. It says that he learned obedience through what he suffered. Not because he had to, because he was perfect. But because he chose to for us, for you and me. He chose to humble himself under the voice of the Father. Even though he is one with him. He chose to humble himself under God. He chose to lay down his life in the ultimate fashion, in the ultimate way, by living a life, taking on sinful flesh and being crucified for you and for me. And we will celebrate him on this road to Bethlehem. Amen? We got some time. I want the band to, to come back up. We got another song. We're going to ring out of them. Um, as they come up, I mean, I think that the... What did we learn today? I mean, first of all, that X-Men movie is ridiculous. You know? <laughs> Hugh Jackman, we, can, we have to make more money. Go back to before we made money that first time and go back further. Who's going to watch that movie, though? I'm going to watch it. I think the implications are obvious in this story. We are called to be heroes. And by the way, our kids are called to be heroes, too. And we know the formula. It's right there. Lay down our lives. Humble ourselves. Let God make something out of us. Something great out of us. I can roll this right out of the way, Corey. Watch this. Let's rise up and let's worship again, okay? Let's thank the Lord. Well, Lord, we look right now, Lord, that you're making heroes out of us, Lord. And we, we look to our author and finisher of our herodom. We look to Jesus. He lived it right. He did it right. He died right. He rose. Lord, he is it. And so we look to Jesus. We continue to look to Bethlehem. We continue to look to that beautiful promise of that promised child being born in our midst, Lord. And in this series, Lord, I pray that we can get glimpse after glimpse after glimpse of the glory that is the birth of Christ. And, Lord, so we just, we just release right now, Lord, just a, this is bold. A hero anointing. <laughs> we release a hero anointing over our people. Humility mixed with you equals awesome. So we choose that, Lord. We embrace that, Lord. We choose to hear your voice over what we see with our eyes of flesh. Lord, make us, Lord, refine us. Lord, whatever, wherever we are, whatever we are, Lord, have your way. Because, Lord, we want to do great things in your name, and you want that for us as well. So we trust you with that. We give that to you in Jesus' name. Amen.